All right, we've made it to act three. Hit me with that theme song. Like, oh, it's so classic. Do I even need to say anything? We already, we, we know, right? We know. The entirety of Wano almost gives me Alabasta vibes in the sense that I think I was halfway through act three and I was thinking, ha, huh, you know, it's been a while since I saw the Straw Hats. Like in Alabasta, it had been such a long time since I saw ocean or any water so much that I felt like this could have been its own series. And that's kind of how I feel about what I'm gonna call Odin piece, the flashback section of the story. I feel like we are really going to dive into a lot of who Odin was in Act 3. And oh boy did we! The first thing we learn about Odin is that he's someone who practically does whatever he wants. Like we see Odin who is eating a meal on top of someone who has just died. And so he's portrayed as this kind of like selfish character. Only to then slip a line that next time we eat, it'll be in the afterlife. And then he leaves and he fuses to elaborate, which is kind of Odin in a nutshell. Like, the amount of times that he does this is just astonishing. He would, like, save a giant beast from the capital and then doesn't want any acknowledgement. He gets banished and he's like, oh yeah, it's because Wano can't contain how cool I am. And he gets a lot of followers without really trying. He has a lot of, I don't care about you, leave me alone, stop eating my food energy, but I would totally actually take care of you attitude. It kind of reminds me of Luffy, like both of the characters do whatever they feel like, which always happens to work out for him. He establishes a community of misfits that don't really fit anywhere else. And there is that immense sense of freedom and adventure. Odin finds a random ship that has been stranded in Wano, which is none other than Whitebeard's ship. And so he just decides, oh yeah, I'm gonna attack Whitebeard, ask him to set sail with him, and then it works, kind of. He has to do a challenge to get a pass from Whitebeard, and when he eventually breaks that challenge to help someone else, he is so optimistic. He's like, welp, I didn't get to ride on Whitebeard's ship, but at least I'm somewhere else I've never been. <laughs> I love Odin's perspective on the world. He is like the embodiment of a person who's just been longing for adventure. When Odin does eventually get to travel, every time a character wants to sneak through and be cautious, Odin runs right in because that's not the person he is. He's just there to explore all there is to see. We also learn a lot about Gold D. Roger in Act 3. Roger has always been my favorite character just conceptually. Like it takes a certain character to laugh and set up a crazy treasure hunt right before being executed. And the more we learn about his backstory, the more I feel that way. He seems like a really competent character behind that goofy exterior. Where Luffy managed to stumble upon Robin who can read the Poneglyphs practically through accident. Roger went out of his way to track down Odin, who he suspected was capable of reading the Poneglyphs. He found Whitebeard and fought, and he begged Whitebeard to lend Odin to him, all because of a hunch. Like, he was on a timer, and he wanted to go search for this amazing treasure. And in the end, Whitebeard agreed, and I love the montage of Roger and Odin exploring the world and visiting places like Water 7 and Skypea meeting Mr. Tom, and diving into Fishman Island. In that sense, I really love Roger and Odin's view on piracy, where it is used more as a tool or representation of freedom and adventure. Down in Fishman Island, King Neptune is all worried about what could happen with the eventual destruction of Fishman Island that we've been foreshadowing, and Roger is just like, yeah, cool story, I don't really care though, I've been doing my own thing over here. <laughs> And you know what? He did eventually find all of the four road poneglyphs and made his way to Laugh Tale. We totally skipped that part out. We still don't know about where the four road poneglyphs could be. But what we do gather is more information about Laugh Tale, where we learn that Roger was too early for the treasure and he was far too sick to come back later. Conceptually, that is really sad. He didn't have a lot of time left and he wanted to go on this really huge adventure to get the biggest treasure around, only to find out that he was in the right place, just not at the right time. <laughs> um, it's kind of ironic that Roger was meant to go on this grand old adventure, that would be his last adventure, where he would find the biggest treasure around, only to find out that, like, nope, actually you're just too early, you can't get it. 
And I find it interesting how Roger is kind of similar to Odin in that regard. Like, whenever you're hit with a bad circumstance, you still manage to take it in a really optimistic route. Like, Roger turned what was potentially just a dead end for him and practically everyone there for a while into one of the biggest treasure hunts around. He was like, okay, I don't have the ability to get this treasure, but what if... <laughs> But what if I made a giant treasure hunt and let the entirety of the next generation be able to claim it? And here's kind of where I want to talk about the cost of adventure. Because Odin left his position as a ruler of Wano to go on like a big quest. And by the time he got back, there were so many downsides. We had a new ruler. Kaido was there to the point where uh, it was just a completely different place. One of the things that I really enjoyed from Act 3 was this mixture of external and personal conflict. We've had Odin who had already wanted to open up Wano's borders, and now with the introduction of Joy Boy had even more of an incentive to do so within these 20 years. I think in that sense Orochi plays a role in that section by being practically a pawn in Kaido's big scheme. Orochi really made his way through by sneaking and deceiving a lot of people, while Kaido had the brute force to back him up. And every time Odin was gonna do something, it was always a mixture of that brute force and that deception that kept Odin down. And that's rough, buddy. It does lead to probably the hardest line I think I've ever seen in this series so far. And that's the fact that throughout Odin's adventure, he's always eaten, well, Odin, who he enjoys very hot. And I, and I didn't see it coming, but it is such a power move that Kaido attempted to boil him alive, and Odin, in the midst of his execution, pulls out the line, Odin was meant to boil. Like, that goes hard. <laughs> like, for Kaido, a person who has been trying to die in a really interesting way, he has, ironically, created really cool ways for other characters to die. And that leads us to the present day. Odin died, his last words were to open up Wano's borders in 20 years time, and we cut to the future, right? We cut to 20 years time where we seemingly start off on like this really grim note where everything has just gone wrong. Only Kinemon and his crew are there and they're all heartbroken and they all gotta go across the river, which is like the stormiest river. And while that does eventually 180 around, while we do eventually get like Luffy and Law and Kid all coming in at once, there is always this feeling of the underdog status. Throughout the entirety of Act 3, it's never really a one-on-one -on -one fight. It's always like a 2-on-3, a 1v2, a 4v4, even characters that do have one-on-ones have multiple one-on-ones. Like, I think almost everyone in the cast takes a shot at Queen at some point, because it's not like a chivalrous fight, it's a war, and everyone's fighting and moving everywhere. Even a lot of the people who are teaming up with each other kind of have a rivalry too. We of course have Kid and Law and Straw Hat who are competing in really petty challenges. And then we have characters like Big Mom who halfway through the fight completely change sides and start attacking their own team. I'm gonna try to talk about the fights, but I just want to let you know there, there's like no structure here. It is so chaotic, especially with how many times we cut back and forth between all of the cast members. We have Big Mom and Kaido versus Luffy, Kid, and Law. We've had this potential trio ever since Sabaody. And just the concept of the new generation of rookies attempting to outclass and showcase that they're actually just as good, if not better, than the old generation is phenomenal. We have already seen Luffy and Law's dynamic, but it's interesting to see what happens when we take Kid into the mix. We have Luffy usually jumping in recklessly or telling Law to do something and Law begrudgingly does it or Luffy is going to get himself killed. And we see Kid reacting to it, usually giving like some snarky remark at Law, only to tick him off. And it creates this really interesting dynamic between the three of them. Because while a lot of Law's appearance makes him seem like he's beyond this game that they're all playing, he's not. <laughs> and I like that here we're actually diving into that a bit. Kid, on the other hand, is really fascinating, just like as a character. We already see that he has a lot of mistrust ever since the failed team-up that he got. 
And we kind of see his begrudging team up with Luffy and Law. Whenever he's up there fighting against Big Mom or Kaido and Luffy or Law tell him like, Hey, uh, do this right now. Kid will begrudgingly do it and say something like, Oh, uh, sure, I'll do it, but not because you told me to. <laughs> Showcasing that even in a really intense life or death situation, where you're fighting like two really strong Yonko, you can still have time for like the pettiest fights of Ego. On the other side, we have Kaido and Big Mom who have a lot of history being with the Rocks Pirates. We got like a little bit of history on the Rocks Pirates in Act 3, where the Rocks Pirates were essentially created to team up for one big score, and it included characters like Kaido and Big Mom and Whitebeard, only for it to get disbanded when none other than Garp and Rogers decided to just destroy this group in God Valley. There is a lot of questions that you can ask in this backstory. But I feel like a lot of it is intentionally vague, especially since a lot of this backstory of the Rocks Pirates focuses so much on the connection between Big Mom and Kaido. We see a lot of Kaido's early life struggling with the Marines and wanting freedom, with his solution being piracy and being helped by none other than Big Mom herself. One of the things that I like about a lot of the characterization in One Piece is the amount of complexity that a lot of the characters receive. Because in the introduction of Act 2, Big Mom and Kaido were practically enemies. They were duking it out and in a matter of time, we went back to the days of the Rocks Pirates. And we came out with Kaido legitimately caring for Big Mom and actually wanting to find the One Piece together. If not for real, then at least for a brief moment, mentally. In some point in Act 3, we have Kid vs. Apu and Killer vs. Hawkins, which is great because Kid has so much beef with these characters. Apu and Hawkins practically screwed him over. They backstabbed him by teaming up with Kaido right in front of him, and then absolutely destroying Kid. So in this fight, we see Kid fully going after Apu, just like a full act of revenge. We also had Killer vs. Hawkins, and I think there is no better character to fight Killer than Hawkins, simply because of his devil fruit. Like, as soon as Killer realizes that he might be damaging Kid, the fight entirely shifts. We go from Killer confidently being able to destroy Hawkins to not being sure what to do. Then Hawkins starts inflicting damage upon himself and Killer has no idea what to do. He's like pleading at some points. And so we get a very strong dynamic between Killer and Kid without even getting to see Kid in this fight. We also see Killer implement a lot of interesting strategy. Like when Killer realized, oh wait a minute, I can cut off Hawkins' arm. <laughs> That's pretty hype. I didn't think about that. Something that I think was totally unexpected from Act 3 was the fact that Zoro was going to be duking it out at some point with Kaido. When they're up on the rooftop, everyone is just trying to deal any sort of damage against the Emperors, which is pretty tough. Like, no one can even dent the skin, let alone cut anything. So we're seeing everyone full on throwing everything they have, and we see Zoro pulling out the big guns, his like last card under his sleeve, where he uses like a finishing blow with hockey to actually strike some damage into Kaido. And the thing is like, I expected the three captains to be up here fighting Big Mom and Kaido. I, I didn't expect Zoro to pop out of nowhere and do that. He like went in, was fighting there for a while, and then did his move, and then got teleported out. And yeah, that put him out of commission for a while, but so much of the early fight was just trying to deal any bit of damage to Kaido. So, uh, good job. Uh, you get a gold sticker. There were a lot of good sections in this story, but I think the weirdest one, probably out of the whole Act 3, was Big Mom and Otama. It makes a lot more sense what happened in Act 2 when we consider what happens in Act 3. Because the interaction between Big Mom and Otama when Big Mom lost her memory was really strange for me. Mostly because it didn't feel like it amounted to anything until in Act 3 we see that Big Mom has this relationship with Otama. Where Big Mom tries to be really nice to Otama to the point where she switches sides and attacks her own team. 
in the end, I don't think it was that important. I think we utilized Big Mom and Otama for like two chapters and that was it. But I just really like the dynamic where you could have two enemies being friends with one person and how that completely shifts the fight into a really weird situation. I wish we utilized this a little bit more, but what can you do? There's a lot going on. So there was an interesting character that was introduced in the middle of Act 3, and that's Yamato. Kaido had a child who was supposed to be the successor to Kaido, except that Yamato does not care at all for Kaido. Yamato heard the line, Odin was meant to boil, and thought it was such a cool line that Yamato thought, yes, I too would like to be Odin. I think it's interesting how Yamato wants to be embedded with all of the same traits that Odin had, especially when it comes to the feeling of exploration and freedom and liberty that he was trying to bring to Wano. I think it makes sense for Yamato to want to be free in that sense. Kaido has a lot of restrictions on Yamato, so much so that Yamato can't even leave the island, like, at all. It's like, yeah, no wonder why, one, no one wants to be you, first of all, Kaido, but also why Yamato would look up to someone like Odin so much. Odin was still heavily restricted back in his time and yet was still capable of exploring the seas. Something that Yamato can't do both because of Wano and because of Kaido. I like that when almost everybody gets knocked off the roof, when both Kid and Law strategically shoot down Big Mom, and when Kaido finally knocks down Luffy, the person who steps up is Yamato. So we kind of get an interesting rematch fight between Odin and Kaido via Yamato. Okay, so this is kind of a little bit of a weird one. Uh, let's talk about Zoro versus King. At first, I kind of didn't care about King that much. We hadn't really built up his character until this fight. So when Zoro versus King happened, my first thoughts were like, okay, we need Zoro to fight somebody, so I guess he's gonna fight King. And it was only as the story went on that we got a lot more information that really quickly turned my opinion on King. We see that King and also a lot of other subordinates of Kaido have a lot of respect towards him, but it's not until King's flashback when we see how much value he puts on Kaido. In the flashback when we see King, he's practically a dead man if it were not for Kaido. He's being experimented in some random government facility and Kaido breaks him out. Considering how King is part of a race that we've practically never seen in One Piece, it's safe to assume that King has witnessed a large part of the negative side of the world. He specifically asked Kaido if he's the person who thinks he can change the world that we currently live in. Something that's later built upon when we realize that King thinks that Kaido is Joy Boy. This person that was meant to travel around the world and free all sorts of people from all over the world. And to that extent, I really love a lot of Kaido subordinates because I'm realizing that a lot of them are putting their chips in and betting on Kaido. Not just to be King of the Pirates, not just to obtain the One Piece, but to create freedom for everyone. Kaido's method of obtaining freedom is through utter violence. There is no other method of obtaining control rather than using brute strength. Now Zoro vs King isn't really about this fight as much as it is about Zoro proving that no, Kaido is not him. <laughs> so not only is this pushing the narrative that Luffy is Joy Boy, but it's also pushing the narrative that Zoro will do anything to put Luffy on top. And we see that by Zoro pushing his own goal forward and becoming even stronger to be able to take down someone who apparently was really difficult to give damage. The other interesting fight was Sanji vs Queen. Throughout the entirety of Act 3, we have been showcasing a lot of Sanji's uh, more mechanical aspects, I guess you could call it. We have his Germa side taking over. And so we see the increasing paranoia that Sanji is feeling every time he puts on the suit and becomes him. On the one side, you're getting dramatically more powerful. And on the other side, you're getting more and more emotionless. And so for Sanji, it's not just that he's getting like a little bit more emotionless. It's the fact that he is becoming more and more like his family, which he desperately does not want to become. Every time Sanji is fighting with Queen or any other character that mentions Jerma, 
Sanji is very quick to try to shut them down. He doesn't want to even acknowledge that name. And that's a very good foil to Queen. Someone who is very much self-deluded in who they are. Queen thinks he's so much more better and tries to one-up Sanji in literally everything. He's like competing in a competition that Sanji does not care about. Queen has managed to mimic a whole bunch of moves that Jerma created. Seemingly having a lot of beef with Jerma, who Sanji completely wants to disassociate from. I like that we got this character arc where we're debating whether Sanji wants to become stronger and lose a part of himself, or be comfortable with being weaker but staying true to who he is. I think this is where we see a lot of the value in the crew in being capable of doing something that one individual might not be able to do, whether it's something personal or based in skill or ethics. That's exactly what happened with the Robin versus Maria fight. We had like all of the women telling Robin like, oh, Sanji's actually weak. He can't do anything. How bad of him. And Robin fully understanding Sanji's predicament rather confidently says that she is glad that she is able to have someone rely upon her. I think that's a really good connection the story makes. Maria doesn't believe her, and still wants to absolutely fight Robin, but here I also think we gave Robin really good characterization. We've had her be sort of the quote-unquote demon child that the world government has assigned to her, and now we have seen that she has fully utilized that name for herself. That yeah, you know what? I am a demon child, and I'm willing to be however mean I have to be to protect my friends. I think that's a really wholesome direction for Robin's characterization. Um, especially when we- <laughs> especially when we contrast that to Robin straight up going demon mode and like snapping the spider's neck. It makes sense. It's just funny. Like, oh yeah, I'll protect my friends. Kill, kill, kill. Okay, I think a pretty hype moment in this arc is Law and Kid versus Big Mom. It's a really interesting turn how Big Mom for so long has been wanting to go after Luffy. And yet she's here right now having to struggle with Law and Kid. Here is also where I'll point out that I've been reading the manga so far. And there are a lot more moments in the anime. Like, it's a completely different fight to a degree. So a question throughout the entire fight for both of the emperors was how in the world do you inflict damage? That very concept was an entire plot point in Whole Cake Island. We were seeing that at the beginning, no matter how hard Kid and Law were fighting, it was pretty difficult to actually deal any damage to Big Mom. First, I want to focus on Kid, who's doing a myriad of different things. One of his really interesting moves was the ability to assign any object a north or a south pole, which then every object will fly towards. I think that is conceptually a really cool ability. We see him use it on Big Mom like two different times and both of those times Big Mom panics and doesn't know what to do. I think Kid for his ability actually is a really good support character. Throughout the fight against Big Mom, Kid is able to hold Big Mom down while Law does any attack. For example, when he awakens his fruit ability and actually goes to attack Big Mom, we see exactly how we're gonna deal damage to Big Mom. Not by attacking her from the outside, Outside, but by literally trying to destroy her from the inside. I also really love Big Mom's ability to get other people's soul in this fight because if she is losing, which she was doing like three or four times, she is so easily able to recover and come back to normal, sometimes even stronger. And conceptually, that just makes her a really intimidating force. We get a lot of glimpses where Kid and Law are getting weaker and more tired throughout the fight and Big Mom keeps coming back even stronger. Narratively, it's really interesting. We're like pushing the characters towards a corner where they can't really kill Big Mom because she just keeps reviving herself in a sense. And so we get to see the characters try to figure out how in the world they're gonna deal with Big Mom if she cannot die. I think it was a pretty cool ability that Law was able to do to quite literally make a burial for Big Mom and straight up launch her in it. It's one of those situations where the characters couldn't outright get rid of the problem, but they can bury it for a while. 
Okay, probably one of the most interesting fights. I feel like I'm saying that a lot. There's just so many good fights in this one. Anyways, a really interesting fight was Jimbei versus Who's Who. I think that <laughs> I think that's his name. Anyways, I find it interesting how he used to be a part of CP9 or CP0, one of those two, but eventually got locked up and had been waiting for such a long time for none other than Joy Boy, who I mean, <laughs> we're, we're gonna get to in a second. But so many characters in this arc have been waiting for Joy Boy. We see Who's Who talking with Jinbei about who potentially could have been Joy Boy. We see him throughout the fight attempting to interrogate Jinbei about what he knows from the Sun Pirates. Because like, yeah, sure, the Sun is technically thematically relevant into bringing the new dawn. But it's not even subtext at this point. There's so many characters talking about how there's going to be this new dawn. There is also quite literally sun god Nika who was going around trying to make everyone happy and helping people. And I wonder who that could be in this current era. I guess the only problem is that who's who, ironically, doesn't know who he's talking to. Because the Sun Pirates are like a sore subject for Jinbei. So to just bring it up, trying to insult him a little bit mid-fight, probably not the best of moves. Here in Act 3, we have so many characters who have been waiting for Joy Boy, which is weirdly enough, working? Like when we first got introduced to Joy Boy back in Fishman Island, I was like, oh, okay, we're gonna get like some more context to who Joy Boy is in these like 400 other chapters, right? Like we gotta. But no, we didn't get anybody talking about Joy Boy in Dress Rosa. We didn't get anyone talking about Joy Boy in Whole Cake Island. By the time we got to Wano, I had totally forgotten about Joy Boy because we didn't even reference Joy Boy in Act 1 or Act 2. This is totally a thing that you have to just remember. And to be fair, yeah, I was. I was just waiting for when we would ever mention Joy Boy again. And here we go, in Act 3. Not only have a lot of characters been mentioning Joy Boy, but one of those characters specifically is Kaido. When Kaido first broke King out, King thought that Joy Boy was going to be Kaido. I wonder if this is something that Kaido actually believed at all, like Kaido had at the very least wanted some version of freedom, something that Joy Boy was apparently said to bring. I think sooner or later though, Kaido realizes that he is not meant to be Joy Boy, but rather instead be the final obstacle in Joy Boy's path. He realizes that he's like the villain of the story and he lives up to that. It kind of adds a lot of depth into his willingness to die. Like he's not just wanting to die, he's wanting someone to kill him in a very honorable way. Like Odin had a good death, Whitebeard had a good death, Roger had a good death. And so throughout this fight with Kaido and Luffy, you can kind of feel Kaido reaching deep down inside and really hoping Luffy to be Joy Boy. It's so weird to think about that Kaido isn't just going to give in and let Luffy kill him, but he does to some degree want someone to step up and take him down. I find it really interesting that as the fight goes on, we see Kaido acknowledging Luffy as an equal. At the start of Act 1, he's kind of mocking Luffy, being like, oh, is that the best you can do, boy? But in Act 3, we see him drinking and fighting and going through different mood swings. We see Luffy trying the hardest he can. He's going into, like, Gear 4 and attacking Kaido. And Kaido is equally acknowledging that and trying the best that he can. I feel like that's one of the reasons why Luffy's loss was such an impactful moment. It is a mixture of shock in realizing that Luffy has lost and an even bigger emotional impact when we get to see Kaido's reaction to that information. Not just because Luffy technically died, we'll get to that in a second, but because Luffy was supposedly like the chosen one who was supposed to strike Kaido down. One of the main reasons why Luffy even lost was because a CP0 member took him out. And I just want to talk about like how destructive that was to Kaido. The only thing at that moment that possibly stopped Kaido from experiencing an amazing death 
was the fact that some random person intervened in his 1v1. Like, it is such a beautifully crafted moment to see Kaido going in for a swing, seeing the CP0 member latch on to Luffy, and seeing Kaido realize that he actually hit and killed Luffy because of something that he didn't even do. Like, someone helped him. Someone ruined this pinnacle fight. And there were a lot of characters who were sad about the fact that Luffy died. But seemingly the saddest person who witnessed Luffy die was Kaido himself. You can see Kaido's realization and his thought process. The disappointment in realizing that, oh, you weren't the guy. He has been building up this moment for 20 years and right there, it's all gone. <laughs> and uh you already know what's happening next everyone has seemingly been waiting for it we get zanisha coming in out of nowhere heading over into wano and there is no moment more hype than seeing the lucid words that joy boy has returned like do you hear the drums of liberation this moment really recontextualizes a lot of the story. This devil fruit has been so important that the world government has been chasing after it for these 800 years. We have changed the fruit into an entirely different fruit. It has gone from rubber to a sun god. And from a character design perspective, Luffy has gone out of this black and red aesthetic over into a more white and gold aesthetic. Like, <laughs> like I'm going to mention this again just because I think it like is really, really important this time. I think it is time that we talk about spirals. If you don't know, ever since back in Ennis Lobby, we have been showcasing more and more spiral imagery. And I honestly think that it might have been for this moment. Not even from a writing perspective, just like from an in-world perspective. As time progresses closer and closer to the return of Joy Boy, the world begins to shift further and further into the spiral pattern. And so I feel like all of the spiral aesthetic was designed around Joy Boy. Like the thing about Joy Boy is that Joy Boy is literally a character floating up in the clouds. In color, style, and abilities, Gear 5th is quite literally Luffy being a god up in the sky. I really like the direction that we took for Gear 5th. For these abilities, we're shifting over into this cartoony fighting style. We see Luffy manipulate the environment like it's a cartoon. The boy thinks he's jolly and whimsical and his attacks reflect that. Like if throughout the fight Luffy randomly pulled out a giant mallet, I wouldn't even question it at that point. Luffy's fighting style beforehand was already extremely weird, but it is just fascinating to see what he's able to do when the entire environment adapts to whatever he's doing. Like, as soon as he returns, we swap from this very serious fight where it's like a life or death situation into practically a comedy. I love that Luffy is in there, he's laughing, he's vibing out. Even Kaido is joining in on the fun. Kaido sees that Luffy came back, and you can just see the relief on his face, being like, oh good, you're not actually dead. And Luffy replies, like, yeah, I'm not, let's, let's keep going. And just like how Law was able to launch Big Mom all the way to the bottom of the earth, I find it interesting that Luffy also launched Kaido to the bottom of the earth. Just because from a writing perspective, if Kaido were to die here, it would fulfill what Kaido has been wanting to do. But I just don't know if we would implement dramatic irony here so that Kaido doesn't actually die here. That the one thing that he's really wanted, in the end, gets rejected. So what comes next, huh? Like what comes after what has been essentially everything that we have been building up ever since the time skip? Like that's one of the weird things, right? Like ever since the time skip, we have been building all the way up to Wano. And now that's finally done. 
It's good to see Momo now fully grown up take responsibility in becoming the ruler of Wano. A lot of his arc focused on him growing up to be a strong leader, and I like that he quite literally had to grow up to achieve that. Like, he's still really emotional, but I like that he has a lot more backbone now. Not only when he was trying to stop Kaido, but now when he was trying to stop the marines from coming in. In Act 3 of Wano, we have built a couple of strings to continue the story, right? We have Robin, which every character has been going after because she is the only character that can discover the Poneglyphs. And so I feel like there's potential for either Blackbeard or Shanks to go after either Robin, which a lot of the characters are going after, CP0 has been going after, her, or Pudding with the potential of her opening her third eye. Like ever since the time skip and just more and more as the story has progressed, we've been getting told that things are getting dramatically more unstable. Even the small things which seem like a joke, like Buggy having a cross guild for example, are equally impacting the world. Like yeah, it's a cross guild led by Buggy, but the cross guild is actively hunting marines. Things are changing. I do like that this has been essentially a way to get rid of the two emperors that we've been fighting against before we really dive in into the final bits that we really need to finish this story. Like we have had an arc with all of the rookies, we have just defeated the two Yonko, and all we really have left is what like Blackbeard, the world government, Shanks, and finding the One Piece. And, and that's, that's it! I can't believe that this review took almost as much time as the Dressrosa review. Not even for the full arc, just for Act 3. <laughs> Anyways, thanks to my patrons who have seemingly survived the war, and also some of them have eaten smile fruits. So I can't tell if they're actually smiling, but I can tell that elephant trunk is quite real. 